as you can see, I am here in the library at Aloka Vihara Forest Monastery. We're up in the uh, Sierra foothills, just uh, about halfway between Sacramento and South Lake Tahoe, California. And um, wonderful welcome to everyone. And thank you so much to SF Dharma Collective folks who make it possible for us to all be gathering here all connected in this way. So I, uh, our usual program, what I think is the usual program anyway, <laughs> is we'll start with uh, the refuges, the homage to the Buddha, the taking refuge in the triple gem, the five lay precepts, and a brief chanting of the Noble Eightfold Path. So I'm going to share screen in just a moment. And you uh, can all feel free to uh, follow along as best you can, or just let it wash over you. Either way, it's uh, good comic seeds. And then around, uh, hopefully by 1.45 or so, we'll be starting a uh, guided meditation. And then we'll have a brief, uh, we'll stop at 2.25 and have about five minutes to stretch legs. Uh, before starting with Dhamma talk at 2.30. So um, or this, it may be just a bit shorter because today's topic is Sama Samadhi, right? Samadhi or right composure of mind. So there's plenty of ground to cover. <laughs> But for now, let me begin by sharing the screen for the refuges and precepts. Um, and before I do that, any sound check? Everything, everybody hearing me all right? Yes, good. <laughs> nice big letters for you to read. Okay, so this is the uh, homage to the Buddha here and the three refuges. So we'll begin with that. And again, everybody just uh, stay muted, please. Keep your mics muted and, uh, and follow along. Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Dutyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutyampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Tatyampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatyampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiyampi Sanghang Sarananga Chami. Ti Saranagamana Mititang means the three refuges are complete. And then the five precepts. So these are the lay precepts as they are understood in early Buddhism and Theravada style Buddhism in particular. And um, what I want to say about them is uh, that the, the Buddha very clearly explained 
ethical behavior, an attitude of harmlessness and integrity as being a foundation for our practice and that we really needed to take that up in order to experience any kind of other progress on the path. So I really recommend them. That said, if you struggle with the precepts for whatever reason, then maybe just take them and try to keep them for today and see how that goes. So I'll say both the Pali and the English and you can feel free to uh, chant whichever part of that feels appropriate to you. And please don't take any precepts that you're not going to keep. Panati pata vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking the life of any living creature. Adina dana vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kame sumi chachara vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musawada vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from false and harmful speech. Sura meraya maja pamadatana vera manisi kapadang samadhyami. I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drink and drugs, which lead to carelessness. Imani pancha sila. Imani pancha sila. Sorry, I don't usually say this part because that's your part and it's not on the screen here. It says, you say, these are the five precepts I undertake. And then uh, sila, morality ethics, is a great blessing. It is the source of true wealth, a source of true happiness and wisdom. May your sila be purified. Great, and then we will do, let's see if we can see it on the screen. Can everybody see that? That's the noble eightfold path. It's a little bit too big. A little uh, up a little bit there. Yeah, better. Okay, beautiful. So we're just gonna chant the uh, Pali part of this. Samadhi, Samasankapo, and so on. Just the black words, okay? And we're gonna do it three times through. So we're just using, this is the, just the, the eight uh, factors on the path, the Noble Eightfold Path, and we're just using it as a bit of a mantra here. Samaditi Samasankapo Samawaja Samakamanta Sama Ajiwo, Sama Wayamo, Sama Sati, Sama Samadi, Sama Diti, Sama Sankapo, Sama Wacha, Sama Kamanto, Sama Ajiwo, Sama Vayamo, Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi. Sama Diti, Sama Sankapo, Sama Vata, Sama Amanto, Sama Jivo, Sama Vayamo, 
Sama Sati Sama Samadhi. Great. All right, so that is, that completes the chanting for today. And so what I'd like to do is just move right into a seated meditation. Or you can also actually try it standing or lying down if that's better for your body. So you can begin by feeling the weight of your body on your seat. Just really grounding into your place, your seat of awakening today. And from that grounded base, allowing the bones of the back to line up as best they can. And the bones of the neck on top of that and the head lightly balanced on top of that. Sometimes it's helpful at this point just to rock a little bit from right to left or from front to back to find that even balance point. To erase any tendency to be leaning toward the computer. But just opening the chest and allowing for this open hearted practice. Placing the hands wherever they feel comfortable to you. Allowing the muscles to release because the bones are taking care of the weight of the body. Eyes open or slightly taking in some light or eyes closed. Either way is just fine. But really allowing the muscles around the eyes to relax. Making any last adjustments to your posture before you settle in to stillness. So steady and relaxed that you don't even want to move.
And now amidst that stillness, perhaps you notice the breath, breathing the body naturally. So take this moment to just observe where you feel the sensation of the movement of breath most strongly. Could be in the nostrils, could be in the throat or in the chest. Some people feel it strongly in the back. Maybe the diaphragm. Any old place is fine. Just rest your attention there, wherever you feel it. No need to force the mind to stop thinking. Thoughts can just continue in the background. Not adding to them or struggling with them in any way. Just staying quietly observing the movement of the breath. And if you find that it's hard to stay with it, then you might imagine a little sigh in your mind with each in-breath or with each out-breath. Just a little, ah, oh, a little pleasantness which with each breath. Staying with the sensation of breath without forcing the mind to stay with the body. Just observing the sensation itself.
And now imagining the mind sinking into a quieter space. Still aware of the breath, just moving into the stillness between the breaths.
now withdrawing the mind even further into that stillness. Letting go of any sounds or any light outside and just turning the mind more inward.
Great. So that uh, <clears throat> is a good start for our experience today, our discussion today of uh, right samadhi. <clears throat> and before I go ahead and get started with the Dhamma talk, uh, we can just take a minute to stretch it out. Maybe turn the head a little bit away from the computer. All right. Before I get started with the Dhamma talk, I'd like to go ahead and pay homage and take refuge again. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami Today's topic is Sama Samadhi. So this is the last of the factors on the Noble Eightfold Path that the Buddha laid out, the historical Buddha. So Sama, as we have been saying uh, throughout these months, my sisters and I, Sama is typically translated as right, or it can also mean uh, sound, like a sound decision, mm. something like appropriate. And this word samadhi, rather than translate it right now, I think I'll just talk a little bit about the experience of it a little bit about um, what it looks like, what it uh, feels like. And then maybe we can explore some words that make sense for it. So samadhi is often uh, mentioned in various uh, frameworks that the Buddha gave for the path of liberation. It's not just mentioned in the Noble Eightfold Path, it's also mentioned as one of the seven factors of awakening. It's also mentioned as one of the five um, faculties or the, the uh, indriya as they're known in Pali, or balas, powers. So, so faculties, when we're working on them, or powers when we've cultivated them. And to be sure, the Buddha made it clear that he felt that this was an important aspect of our practice to cultivate. But it's not an end in and of itself any more than we would say right speech or right effort. 
is an end in and of itself, right? The factors of the path go together. And this one comes uh, at the end, in part because it's supported by sati, supported by mindfulness, but it's also supported by all the other factors as well. And it also improves our ability to, uh, to know what is right view or right intention or right speech. But what Samadhi is pointing to is pointing to a kind of stillness and clarity at the same time. It's pointing to an experience of mind that is separate from thought. It's pointing at a kind of um, One way that Bhante Sujato translates this is as immersion. I like that because it's very true to the experience of it. Immersion. Or sometimes also the experience of it can be like an absorption, like getting really, you know, like the way you think of getting really absorbed in a book or getting really absorbed in a some kind of exercise or something where you are not tuned into the external anymore. You're very, very deeply penetrated into the object that you're focused on, the thing that you're working with. And the Buddha listed about 40 different meditation objects that could be used for the development of samadhi. Although the one that we most hear about is the breath. That's why we did the meditation in the form we did it today. Most people work with the breath. And in particular, the sensation, the actual feeling of movement of the breath, the physical feeling of movement of the breath as a way of anchoring the mind. But there are any number of other different objects, including things like uh, the four elements, the um, certain colors, um, the uh, four immeasurables or the four Brahma Viharas, right? The four uh, boundless states of mind, states of love, you could say. <laughs> so there are many different objects on which we can place the mind, but the idea behind samadhi is that the mind has, has its own Its natural tendency is towards stillness. It's, it has its own knowing about how to find this place of stillness and clarity. If we are willing to let the flotsam, the other stuff that's floating around, just get out of the way. But it requires, it requires interestingly, and this is why I'm not translating it the way that most people would just yet, but we'll get to that. It requires a breadth of mind, a kind of open receptivity of mind at the same time as being able to be with one thing in a steady, continuous way. And that's a bit of a challenge, right? Sometimes it's very easy to have a wide open mind. Maybe you've done, for example, a meditation on hearing sound or in the Zen tradition, there's shikantaza, which is or in Theravada, it's called choiceless awareness, where you're just allowing a kind of breadth of experience and receiving perceptions in whatever order they come. That's, that's a very open way of working with the mind. But 
to do to have that kind of openness and simultaneously a kind of persistent steady attention with clarity and with some level of detail with a very fine level of detail that can be hard because when to get down into the detail maybe there's this feeling like you have to constrain the mind right like you have to sharpen it somehow and that was a very common way that can be a very common way that it's talked about that i would say from my own life experience is not super helpful which is that there are said to be for the the um uh so so there are uh let me go back for a second before i get to the that there are various types of samadhi various um uh, levels of this kind of engagement of the mind. So you can have, you can have some basic stillness, and you can have um, different degrees of that, deeper and deeper until you get to the states called the jhanas. Right. So if you look at the way that right samadhi is usually discussed by the Buddha in the suttas, in the majority of cases, I would say. Not that I've read them all, but <laughs> in the majority of cases that I've seen, let's put it that way, the Buddha describes right samadhi as the four jhanas. Okay, and so jhana means, uh, basically means meditation, but more specifically, it means these very, very deep states of clarity and stillness. And um, The Buddha described four different stages of them, and then the what's called a rupa jhana. So there are the four form jhanas, and then there are the four formless jhanas, which come afterwards, which have objects like boundless space and things of that nature, things that are much, much more conceptual, less, less physically based. And they are to be taken in order. So those arupa jhanas, those four arupa objects are one of some of the four of the 40 but you can't actually start with those you have to start with one of the other ones but to talk about the four basic jhanas the four form jhanas so the first jhana is said to have five qualities and this is back to what i was saying a moment ago but there there can sometimes be some confusion about this so the five factors that are required to be present for the first stage of jhana are vitaka and vichara, and those two go together. So the way I remember it is tak, this word tak, which means to like place, or I think of like tacking. You're tacking the mind onto your object, vitaka, right? Then vichara. So chara means something like staying with the thing. So Vichara is that, is the persistence. So you tack the mind on the object, but then you have to keep it there for some, per, some period of time. And then there is PD, not to be confused with pity, but PD <laughs> and, or PETA. That's the other way that I hear it sometimes. That's always fun. <laughs> no Mediterranean foods required. Sorry. Um, PD, which is, uh, rapture it's said to be rapture and why is that word used it's a really funky old word but it's actually kind of true to the experience which is it's like this very energized buoyant joy like woohoo pt is like a very very high kind of state joyful state and then sukha goes with the pt usually and sukha is a little more mellow so the way that the Buddha described this in his classic metaphors, which may or may not resonate with us, but his uh, way of saying it was, if you're walking through a desert and then you hear about an oasis, right? If you're like dying of thirst, walking through a desert and you hear from someone, hey, there's an oasis, there's some water just down the road here, just across those few sand dunes, then you get that woohoo feeling, right? Then you get the piti. But when you get to the oasis and you have a drink of water and you're chilling by the pond, that's the sukha, okay? That's the happiness. So 
sometimes a night just kind of more mundane words for this is joy and happiness okay piti sukha and then the fifth factor ekagata ekagata which literally if you take it apart the etymology in pali means that it means one pointed one pointed but as many teachers particularly very funny to see bantu sujato talk about this and roll his eyes is again uh, John is not pointy at all. There's a, there is a receptiveness and a fullness and a openness to the mind in order to be in jhana. It just is like that. You can't have, you can't have that kind of uh, uh, constriction or the kind of uh, narrowing of the mind and still be in jhana. It doesn't work. So, but what ekagata means is more like um, free of any other distractions. And what this feels like, one way to describe what this feels like is like, um, sometimes it can feel like a window just coming down, literally like a, like, you know how you close a window and then the sound from the outside stops if you have a nice windows, comes, starts coming from the outside or at least, at least mitigated right? Or like uh, you close the, if you have a blackout curtain, you close the curtain and there's no light, right? So like that. So the mind does, can, on its own, when it's ready, will do this thing of like, chunk, and just close the window to all of your sense functions. There's no hearing of any outside stuff going on anymore. There's no perception of light. There's no sensation of what you're sitting on. None of that. It's just the mind relating to the mind at that point. Although it's, and this is what I was, maybe, and maybe you heard this in the, in the meditation instruction, you weren't quite sure what I was referring to. So you tack the mind onto a physical sensation, like the feeling of the air coming in the nostril, let's say, which for some people is way too constrained of an object, but that's one of the ones that's been very often used in Thailand, for example, there's a very famous master, Pa Ok Sayada, who teaches people how to do it that way. Um, in any event, you tack the mind onto a physical sensation of the breath, let's say. But then what happens is that the mind will want to kind of pull back from that. It's still aware of the sensation, but it's what it's, but it's aware of its own, it's aware of its concept of the sensation, so to speak. So it, it's kind of moved slightly back away from the body. It's a, this is kind of, I'm trying to describe it quite literally for you. So, so it's actually, they say this is called the learning sign, a certain kind of nimitta, where, where there's just a slight noticing of like, oh, the mind is stilled enough that it's pulled back slightly from the object. It's still there, it's still aware but it's pulled back slightly. And then there, there's another layer of signs, so-called signs that, that come and people have heard about these before also, like there are certain kind of lights, right? And if you're focused on the breath, there can be a certain kind of light that moves with the breath or um, certain colors, or there's one that's kind of like, it's kind of like sunrise. It's like a light that's kind of, that's that's up here somewhere, and gets brighter. Um, so you can have different kinds of uh, visual stimulation that is internal. That is also a sign that the mind is becoming ready to immerse itself. So these are all kind of steps on the way and you're just staying with the object, just staying with the objects, just staying with the object. You can use the lights. If you start to have lights, you can use the lights as the object that you're paying attention to more so than the actual breath itself. You can sort of go to that, but I don't recommend uh, messing with it so much, like trying to brighten it. Some people would say, oh, try to brighten it up or have it be, you know, like this. I wouldn't recommend that. I think that that actually then gets into a kind of um, directive mind that's likely to pop you out more than get you deeper. 
So all of these things are happening and, and basically slowly but surely what's happening is the opposite of scattered mind. So there is this primitive aspect to us, which is normal, which is the mind scanning out here all the time for risks mostly, right? For problems or for goodies, right? <laughs> so this is constantly happening, right? Going out, the mind is going out and going, oh, you know, is that the mailman bringing my package? Or, you know, I got to remember to call so-and-so or what was that on my phone? Or, you know, gosh, I'm uncomfortable. Maybe I should get up. You know, any number of these kinds of like, I think of them as like tentacles, right? All these tentacles going out. But slowly but surely through the process of Samadhi meditation, and whether or not you get to jhana, through any kind of uh, meditation that's leading toward this uh, immersion or absorption, the tentacles are kind of getting pulled in. The mind is pulling in on itself. And because that happens, interestingly, and this is the paradox of it, so bear with me, because that happens, then there is also a vastness to that experience. Because not limited to this stuff, right? Not limited here anymore. If you've if the mind is pulled away from those sense organs and stuff, then there's like this much open, much more open kind of inner realm that can be experienced. In fact, speaking of Zen folks, uh, Shinru Suzuki Roshi, so the founder of San Francisco Zen Center, very famously wrote in Zen Mind Beginner's Mind, he said, the inner world is limitless, the outer world is limitless, and the inner world is limitless. So it might be easy to think of the outer world like space being limitless, but if we if we have this kind of experience of jhanas, then the inner world is also quite limitless, quite boundless. And again, also not limited by concept, not limited by what you could think of or what you could understand, okay? But then the mind itself. So using a Theravada reference, Ajahn Chah. So Ajahn Chah, you know, very famous Thai meditation master in whom the two Aya that founded Loka Vihara uh, in, in that lineage, they practiced in that lineage back in England before they came to the States. And um, Ajahn Chah also, also uh, said, you know, he said, feelings and emotions, they come and they deceive the mind. But the mind is not that. The mind in its own nature is still. That's the nature of the mind. And that's why if we can, um, if we can build up this capacity for um, not being so outwardly engaged, then the mind knows its own way to samadhi. There's a, there literally it's like changing the channel. It's changing its own channel. Okay. And that might sound scary to you, but actually it's, it's, um, it's better than any channel you would choose. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> when you're choosing your own channels, it's better than any channel you would choose of your own volition. Yeah. So, so let me just say a few more words about this, and then I'm going to open it up for questions because I think it would be great to do that. So um, Ajahn Chah also said, if you have enough concentration, that was how it was translated, or samadhi, or immersion, or composure, collectedness of mind, to read a book, that is enough to wake up. That's enough for full awakening, right? That said, I will say also that the jhanas are very, very powerful states. The mind is an incredibly powerful instrument and you really get a sense of the power of the mind when you can 
do this kind of stillness. And, and um, it's, it's uh, because what happens is then you have this like, uh, this very, very harnessed capacity, which you then turn back to the other factors of the path. You then turn that back to your lived experience in your body, in your mind, in your regular everyday life. And you can see it with more clarity, with more detail, and with a certain kind of not being so moved by it. Because you know that there is this other aspect, there is this mind that is unaffected by any of that. So there's a certain kind of confidence that comes out of samadhi practice. Not a confidence like an egotistic, it can lead to egotistical, I should say that. And actually Bhante Ji, Bhante Gunaratana, who is a Sri Lankan monk who's written a lot of books uh, for Westerners about this kind of practice, often mentions that it's very easy for people to get arrogant when they can achieve these kinds of states. But actually that's a mistake because the kind of confidence that it should give you is that the nature of this body and mind is clear in and of itself. It doesn't need you to drive it actually. It doesn't need a self to drive it. So, so confidence in the mind's clarity, much more peace, I would say more ability to balance the mind, to balance the mind from extreme states because you can, you can come um, and, and actually observe those extreme states more clearly, but also know again that um, there are causes and conditions that are creating that. So you can see the process nature of mind also much more clearly. And it's, a, of course, because of all those reasons, it's a strong support for insight. And that is why fundamentally the Buddha said samadhi is an important practice because it is a support for being able to see clearly yata bhutang jnana dasana, knowing and seeing the way things truly are. And that knowing and seeing the way things truly are is what will unhook you from suffering. So you need a few things in order to develop this. One of the things you need is seclusion. Seclusion, both physically in terms of putting yourself in an environment where you can sit steadily, repeatedly on a, you know, ongoing basis. Consistency helps a lot. Lots of hours on the cushion help a lot, right? You kind of get in, in your mind in that habit but also mental seclusion, meaning don't be overwhelming the mind with sense stimulation. If you want to find a mind that is this still and this composed, then you, you have to be willing, at least for some period of time, and this is why people go on retreat, you have to be willing to set down a lot of sense stimulation. And the last thing that I would suggest is what has been extremely, extremely valuable and joyful for me, because as I said, joy and happiness are two of the key factors in samadhi, is Brahma Vihara practice. Metta practice is one of the most common ways, actually, that I think people can move into the jhanas, because, again, it has this openness of mind, it has a brightness of mind, it has a pleasantness and a joy. And so it's, it's already kickstarting a lot of the basic factors that you need. So Brahma Vihara practice is actually taught by the Buddha as being both, both a, a practice that develops a lot of good kama and burns off the hindrances and burns off bad kama, but also as a practice that cultivates a mind that will lead to concentration. He said it over and over again. So with that, I'm going to stop and we can uh, have some comments or questions or
whatever you would like to uh, add. So you can just raise your biological hands <laughs> if you have a question. Okay, great, Andrea. Hi, Aya. Um, Hi. <laughs> Hi, Andy. <laughs> Thank you for the the talk. And yeah. I was wondering with the with the quote from Ajahn Chah, like if you can read a book, like if you have enough. I don't know which word to use, but well, concentration, you can read a book, but uh, if you can read a book, you can do meditation. But what happens with the people who uh, have mental illness or have a psychosocial disability? Um, mm. Mm. Are they able to, well, it depends, no? There are lots of types of mental illness, but right. uh, are they able to work with this? Well, just as you said, and it depends a lot on what is the mental experience that that person is having, right? So to, to um, if the mind is overwhelmed with fear, okay, I will say just as a point of, uh, sorry, I'm trying to arrange my rope here and talk to you at the same time. So let me do one thing. <laughs> um, as a matter of uh, just personal disclosure, my, my mother had quite a bit of mental illness throughout her lifetime. And she was, she was a person who was overwhelmed with fear for, for, a long period, for long periods in her life um, until she got into a, a situation where she was receiving the right kind of medication and the right kind of medical care. So if the mind is overwhelmed with fear, it's not possible. It's not possible because that, as I was saying, that kind of primitive mind that is always scanning for risks is like at high alert all the time. And so it won't pull back in. It won't because it doesn't, right? There's not enough safety. It doesn't perceive enough safety to pull in and be inwardly focused. Um, the Buddha recommended, that said, the Buddha recommended also metta practice for fear that nourishing our hearts with the intention for well-being, not just others' well-being, but our own well-being is a very important way of responding to that mind that's experiencing that. So I would say in, that, in those kinds of cases where people are overwhelmed with fear or overwhelmed with um, certain kinds of neurosis or things that are keeping the mind pointed outward, for safety reasons, then start with the metta practice and see what can develop there. That would be the key. But um, but yeah, even that, even that. I mean, I've known people who had um, pretty serious mental illness and have been strong practitioners, strong life lifelong practitioners, and you know, lived in sangha and. Um, lived a life of service and, you know, became good meditators, became very proficient meditators, I would say. So it just, it depends a lot on the factors of the individual person and whether they have enough support, you know, enough of the physical supports in their environment and also a teacher or teachers who can help walk them through what's realistic for what's happening in their own mind. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Tom. Are the uh, Brahma Vihara practices meditations? Yes. Okay. Yes. Particularly if you do, uh, so there are two primary forms of the Brahma Vihara practice. There's the, what I call the recitation form, right? Where you're reciting your intention for loving kindness toward yourself, toward all beings, toward folks who are difficult for you or towards animals or whatever. You can come up with any number of categories. Um, that I do that practice first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening as a way of resetting the intention each day. Um, but if you're doing the radiating form, so that's the one that the Buddha taught in the suttas, 
where you abide with a mind heart, a chitta, which is both mind and heart, all of our cognitive experience, imbued with loving kindness, and you're allowing that to flow in all directions, right? That is exactly that, right? That flowing, that visualization of a light or a smoke or a water, however you see the metta flowing in all directions, that's your mind. That's why the Buddha recommends it, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, he, you know, there's a very famous sutta in which the Kalamas, they lived in an area probably close to the Silk Road. I don't know. I'd have to look at the, the old maps where they were getting a lot of teachers coming through. And so they were really confused. And when the Buddha came, they said, I'm like, these teachers are always trashing each other. And I don't know, I don't know what, how to understand that. And the Buddha said, if you try it and you know, if you try the practice of a teacher and you know that it leads to goodness in your life, it leads to more wisdom and compassion, then stay with that, right? Stay with that. And then what did he teach them immediately after he made that statement? He taught them the Brahma Viharas as a meditation, mm -hmm. this kind of radiating from the heart, loving kindness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there are several of ours. Yeah, there are some from me. There are some from my Ananda Bodhi, probably some from my Asanjita also on Dharma Seed. So if you want to try out the radiating form of the loving kindness meditation or of all four of the Brahma Viharas, they're on our website up there. And our New Year's retreat is going to be based on the Brahma Viharas too. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, probably time for one more question before I chant the blessing. One more. No? Okay, well, we'll go with blessing then. And just to say, please do give it a try, okay, folks? Please don't underestimate your own capacity for meditation, for progress, particularly in samadhi meditation, and in all of the Noble Eightfold Path. Oh, that's one thing I wanted to do. I'm going to read you this beautiful quote by Bhikkhu Bodhi before I give you the blessing chant. Ah, that's what I want to do last. Okay, ready? Because this is about the whole of the Noble Eightfold Path. He says, Bhikkhu Bodhi, from this book on the Noble Eightfold Path, very good little pithy book. I've said it before. This is a really good one if you're interested. Bhante says, a spiritual tradition is not a shallow stream in which one can wet one's feet and then beat a quick retreat to the shore. It is a mighty tumultuous river which would rush through the entire landscape of one's life. And if one truly wishes to travel on it, one must be courageous enough to launch one's boat and head out for the depths. Hmm? The Dhamma is the mighty tumultuous river which would rush through the entire landscape of your life. And if you truly wish to travel on it, then you have to be courageous enough to launch your boat and head out to the depths. So I wish that for all of you today. What, what book is and that? It's a, it's a little, very short book called The Noble Eightfold Path by Bhikkhu Bodhi, Tom. Oh, okay, Bhikkhu Bodhi. Okay, mm -hmm. Bhikkhu Bodhi, The Noble Eightfold Path. So may you all be well and joyful and have a very fruitful, fulfilling path of practice now and in the future. And may all uh, beings benefit from any goodness, any wisdom, any joy that has arisen here today. Bhavatu sabha mangalang rakantu sabha devata Sabha Buddha Nubhavena Sada Soti Bhavantu Te 
Bawa tu sabah manggalang rakan tu sabah dewata. Sabah dhamma nubawena sadasoti bawan tu te. Bawa tu sabah manggalang rakan tu sabah dewata. Sabah sangha nu. Bawena sada soti bawan tu te. May you have every good blessing. May all the devas protect you by the power of the Buddhas, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. May you ever be well. Take care, everyone.